Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. You know, one of the lessons we all learn in life, as cliche as it sounds, is appearances can be deceiving. This past Tuesday, I'll give you a couple examples of that. This past Tuesday, I woke up around 7 a.m. Laura was gone for the day, uh, off to work. I was waiting for uh, her mom uh, to show up and babysit um, so I could get down here for a staff meeting. So I get up. All of a sudden, I'm doing my morning routine, and I'm greeted by two smiling little girls, and they have a cookie for me, (laughs) seven o'clock in the morning. They say, here, Daddy, we we made this special cookie for you. We put some of Mommy's uh, uh, icing, cake icing on top. Here, take a bite. And I said, oh, thank you so much, guys. I'll save it for later. I I shouldn't eat a cookie this early. Obviously, it doesn't really look like I follow that rule, but... (laughs) And I said, so I, you know, just put it in the pantry, I'll have it later. I said, okay. A few minutes goes by. They come back up to me with the cookie. They're like, Dad, can you please, please, please try it? We're dying to see if you like it. All right, all right, fine, fine. I'll take a bite. So imagine my surprise when I bite into a cookie and quickly realize that they didn't put icing on top. They put toothpaste. Oh. my girls. And then that's okay, the three of us pranked my mother-in-law when she came, so. (laughs) Appearances can be deceiving. You know, there are also times when appearances can be dangerously deceiving. Take the the lionfish, for example. It's a beautiful, exotic fish with with showy red and and white stripes. It it looks like such a rare and and fragile and and gentle fish, but looks can be deceiving. See, in actuality, the lionfish is an invasive predator with venomous spines, and its venom could cause uh, immediate and excruciating pain said to be a bee sting times 40. And we have proof of a man who was stung. Yep. Appearances can be dangerously deceiving. And the sad reality is that appearances can even be deadly. Back in 1974 at a state park in Washington, while hundreds of locals were enjoying uh, that lake in the state park, it was a beautiful day of weather outside. All of a sudden, a quiet and and quite attractive man approached a a petite 23-year-old woman named Janice. The man was wearing a a white tennis outfit, and he had his arm in a cast. Looking like someone who needed some assistance, he asked Janice if she could help help him uh, unhook the boat from his Volkswagen. And she was eager to help him. After all, what could go wrong? He was handsome. He looked like he needed some help. Unfortunately, Janice was never heard from after She was seen walking to his vehicle because the man who deceived her was none other than Ted Bundy. Appearances can be deceiving, even deadly. Sometimes this deception comes with consequences. Biting into a cookie with toothpaste on it, not much of a consequence. Spending thousands of dollars on a counterfeit diamond that looks real, That's going to have some consequences. Getting into a serial killer's car because he looks innocent, 
It's going to have consequences. Choosing to believe the educated and articulate pastor who, who so convincingly argues that certain things the Bible calls sins are not actually sins. That's going to have consequences. See, just because something looks good or attractive doesn't mean it is. Just because something sounds good and attractive doesn't mean it is. Appearances can be deceiving. In fact, in our passage this morning, this is the very thing we're going to see. In Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 44, Jesus is about to call attention to the fact that appearances can be deceiving. And in doing that, he's going to expose the hypocrisy of the temple establishment. How the religious leaders looked externally pious and attractive, but how really they were internally corrupt. They were selfish. So the very sobering truth that, Mark's, that Mark reminds us of in the passage this morning is that Jesus detests spiritual hypocrisy. Jesus detests spiritual hypocrisy. So Mark records for us three short narrative episodes that we'll see in our passage. And we'll see that someone can talk the part and be wrong, just like the scribes were with their teaching of Messiah. We'll see that somebody could look the part and still be faking it, like the scribes did with their, their grandstanding and spiritual showiness. And then we'll also see that someone can even act the part and still be insincere, like some of the rich people who were donating large sums of money to the temple that day. So a little bit of background, just to pick up where we were. Remember, Jesus has been going all throughout Israel the last three and a half years. Right? He started his earthly ministry when he was about 30 years old, and then crucified when he was about 33 and a half. So he's been going all throughout Israel the last three and a half years, performing amazing miracles. He's been casting out demons. He's been healing the blind and the diseased. He's been raising little girls and young men from the dead. He's been going into the synagogues. He's been challenging the religious leaders and demonstrating a masterful understanding of the Old Testament as he, as he explains all these prophecy, prophecies about the Messiah, all the, the prophecies that these religious leaders who studied the law, studied the word, that they just seemed to miss. Jesus has been proclaiming that, that God's kingdom has come and invaded our world, and he's been inviting people to be part of that kingdom. Unfortunately, though, for many of them, many of the Jews believed that this kingdom would primarily be an earthly kingdom. So a large majority of the people in Jerusalem started following Jesus because they're assuming he's going to dethrone the Romans. But really, Jesus came to dethrone sin and death. But Jesus keeps dropping hints that his first coming isn't to defeat Rome. His first coming isn't to destroy them and give them nat national freedom. That's not what his, his first coming is all about. His first coming is about providing spiritual freedom. But the people still don't understand, at least not entirely. So that's what you see all throughout this min his ministry. They went, these people went throughout their entire lives hearing that the teachers of the law explain that Messiah would be King David's son, right? An heir of King David who will rule the same way David himself ruled, with a crown, with a sword, with an army, with lots of money. But because Jesus is making claims to be the Messiah, and he's backing up his claims with miracles, because he's showing how the Hebrew scriptures testify of him, he's getting very, very popular. So this starts to really disrupt the entire religious establishment of first century uh, Israel. The crowds aren't listening to the leaders and lawyers and, po and pastors and politicians of their day. Instead, they're listening and following this 33-year-old unassuming carpenter, from Nazareth. In fact, just two days prior to the events that we're going to look at today, the crowds who were in Jerusalem for the Passover festival welcomed Jesus. That took place on a Sunday. They, they welcomed him with shouts of Hosanna. And then on the next day, Monday, Jesus makes a scene in the temple by kicking out some vendors, knocking over some tables, and calling out the leaders for their corruption. So the Jewish leaders see all this. They hear all this, and they start to get really angry. Then they realize that more and more and more of the people who usually follow their teaching have become astonished by Jesus' teaching and are listening to his words and not theirs. So now they really want to destroy him. They really want Jesus dead. So Tuesday of Jesus' final week, 
rolls around. And it's a really long day this Tuesday because that's when he and the disciples enter the temple. That's when some of the religious leaders confront him. They start hounding him with all these questions. And that's what we looked at the past couple weeks. But, but one by one, we saw Jesus field every question. We saw Jesus defeat every challenge. He, he just finished mopping up the floor with these guys because Mark tells us at the passage right before this, he says, no one dared ask him any more questions. They were afraid to ask Jesus any more questions because he kept trapping them. He kept giving them the answers and they didn't know what to do. Now we arrive at Mark chapter 12, verse 35. Okay, and we pick up where we left off last week. So now that the leaders back off and they shut up, Jesus steps up and he starts to go on the offensive. Okay, he's going to turn the tables on them because now it's his turn to ask them questions. Except he's not going to stand against them as an opponent the way they stood against him. See, Jesus questions them not to prove himself right and them wrong. That's, that's improper motivation. And Jesus was sinless. He questions them actually because he wants to give them another opportunity to acknowledge their error and their hypocrisy. He wants to give them another opportunity to receive the reality of his messiahship. Jesus detests spiritual hypocrisy, but he loves the hypocrite. So what we're going to see through this passage are are three warning signs, three warnings for discerning hypocrisy in ourselves and others. So here's the first warning sign. We're going to run through this passage. First warning is this, beware of teaching that misrepresents scripture. Beware of teaching that misrepresents scripture. Mark chapter 12, verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of God? Okay, so, so pause there. So Jesus is in the temple. He begins his questioning by drawing attention to a specific teaching of the scribes. Now, the scribes were the lawyers, and, and they, were, they were the judges of uh, first century uh, Jewish society. They were experts in the Old Testament law. They knew all 613 Old Testament laws inside and out. They, they memorized large portions of scripture. They, they interpreted so much scripture. They memorized um, other scribes' interpretations of scripture. So it was common for scribes, too, to to have students for whom they could teach the the, the finer points of the law. So so these these are guys who are experts in their material. These teachers of the law taught that the Christ, the Messiah, anytime you see the the word Christ, Jesus Christ, Christ isn't his last name, that's that's a a title that that means Messiah. So Jesus Christ, the Messiah, they taught that Messiah would be a human descendant of King David. And they weren't wrong either because the Old Testament does tell us that the Messiah would, be, would descend from King David's line. He would be a human descendant from King David. But that's not all the Old Testament teaches about Messiah's identity. And Jesus makes this point. Look at verses 36 and 37. He said, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord... Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. All right, so what's going on over here? This looks a little confusing, a little hard to understand. Well, here, understand Jesus is quoting Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110 was a messianic psalm. It was a messianic prophecy written by King David. So King David, in that psalm, prophesied about the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, saying to his Lord, his Christ, Messiah, sit at the exalted and authoritative seat to my right. Meaning King David himself recognized that this Messiah would be his Lord. So the scribes teach that Messiah is David's son by descent, which is true. So this means Messiah is David's uh, junior in age, also true. But that's not the entire picture. David himself revealed in Psalm 110 that Messiah is also his Lord, which means in some mysterious way, this Messiah figure is also superior to David. He's senior in rank. So yes, Messiah is David's son, and therefore he must be human, but also Messiah is David's Lord. So he must be something more than human. See, there's plenty about the Messiah that the scribes don't know. They don't have a full understanding of his identity. So Jesus' question is meant to get them thinking about their preconceived notion of Messiah. See, they taught that Messiah would be David's son, but what the Old Testament actually teaches is that Messiah will be human as the son of David And 
divine as the Lord of David. Which is why Jesus asks them, how can the Messiah be both David's Lord and son? What he's essentially saying is, you guys are the experts in the law. You teach that Messiah, the one who will deliver Israel and bring peace to the world. You teach that he will be a son, a descendant from the line of King David who will rule on David's throne. But your understanding of Messiah is way too small. Messiah is not just David's son. He's also David's Lord and superior to him in so many ways. So teachers of the law, tell me, how can the Messiah both be David's son and David's Lord? How can he be, both be human and divine? Jesus' question was met with silence from the scribes and amazement from the crowds. See, the only way Messiah could be both David's son and Lord is if Messiah is both human and divine. And the only way for Messiah to be both human and divine is if the Messiah is God himself incarnated into David's lineage. That's exactly what happened with Jesus of Nazareth. We call this the incarnation. This is a big deal. A lot of even some so-called Christian religions don't believe this the way the Bible teaches it. Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, and the God of David is standing right there in front of them, and they miss it. They spent their entire lives studying every jot and tittle in the Old Testament, yet they miss the heart of the one who gave those words to all those prophets. Because they misunderstood the identity of Messiah, they were wrong in their expectations of the Messiah. See, they only understood a human Messiah who would restore David's political kingdom in Israel. They failed to acknowledge the possibility of a divine Messiah, someone who would first restore God's spiritual kingdom throughout the world. And the simple fact is that these teachers of the law were the ones who spent the most amount of time in God's word studying Messiah. That they refused to recognize the Messiah right in front of them means that they misread the scriptures. It means that they completely missed the heart of God on the pages of the Old Testament. See, if the, the scribes had bothered to look for God, to understand the character of God, the person of God, the heart of God in the Old Testament, if they truly knew God as he revealed himself to their ancestors, if they truly loved God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they would have embraced Jesus as the Messiah. But they reject him. They reject him. And their rejection of him proves that they use the scriptures as a tool to build their own religion, not as a means to deepen their fellowship and their understanding and their communion with God. They were spiritual hypocrites. And this serves to remind us that we need to beware of teaching that misrepresents Jesus. We need to beware of teaching that misrepresents scripture. There's so much teaching, so many experts on everything and anything that we live in an age that any of this stuff can be accessed in a moment, in an instant. So we need to be on guard, discerning of the foundational teachings of Scripture, being confident in what the Bible teaches about things like the identity of Jesus, the reality of sin and the necessity of salvation. If we're studying and meditating on the Scriptures as our source of truth, we won't be tossed around by every new wave of doctrine and religion. See, you have to understand that the, everybody in the temple in the, the first century, as they're hearing the scribes, they didn't have their own copies of the scroll to kind of go back to their tent and be like, oh, I'm going to go see if what that scribe said was true. They didn't have that. They just relied on the scribes. They just had copies of, the, they had scrolls, they had them in the synagogues. And they would rely on the interpretation and reading from the scribes. Guys, we have the completed revelation of Scripture. It's available everywhere. If you're listening to me more than you're listening to God in Scripture, if you're listening to Pastor Dave or any of us or any podcast more than you're actually reading Scripture, you're doing yourself a major disservice because what you're listening to are the interpretations of someone else. You need to be in the Scripture. That's how you're going to discern false teaching from true teaching. And the reality is, it is so important to know what we believe. It is so important to know why 
we believe what we believe. You know, not only so we won't be led astray, but also so we won't unintentionally lead other people astray. The world is filled with crowds and churches and cults and celebrities who believe and, and represent only certain things about Jesus, right? Some only want a Jesus who loves, not a Jesus who judges. Some will only follow a Jesus who affirms all sexual preferences and gender identities. Some will only see Jesus as a good example from whom we can learn how to help other people and become better versions of ourselves. But any teaching that misrepresents Jesus in such a way is false teaching. Now, most of us in here wouldn't believe such blatantly false lies about Jesus, but what about deceptively false ones? What about those times we subconsciously attach to Jesus um, our values, our desires, and we make him to be, out, to be someone who actually looks a lot like us? Every time that happens, we create a false version of Jesus. And there are lots of false versions of Jesus running around in the world and running around inside our heads. A theologian and author, Kevin DeYoung, writes about some of these false versions of Jesus. So I'm going to read a, a quick list of some of these false versions he talks about. And I want you to think, are there any that resonate with you? Maybe you're believing one of these Jesuses more than one of the others. So here's some of the false versions. He says, there's Republican Jesus, who's against tax increases and for family values and owning firearms. There's Democrat Jesus, who's against Wall Street and Walmart and for reducing our carbon footprint and redistributing funds to lower income families. There's Therapist Jesus, who helps us cope with life's problems, heals our past, tells us how, value, how valuable we are and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's Starbucks Jesus, he drinks fair trade coffee, loves spiritual conversations, drives a hybrid, and goes to film festivals. There's open-minded Jesus. He loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for people who are, who are not as open-minded as you. There's touchdown Jesus. He helps athletes run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcomes of Super Bowls. There's hippie Jesus who teaches everyone to give peace a chance, imagine a world without religion, and helps us remember all you need is love. There's yuppie Jesus who encourages us to reach our full potential, reach for the stars, and buy a boat. There's spirituality Jesus who hates religion, churches, pastors, priests, and doctrine. He wants us to find the God within. There's platitude Jesus, good for Christmas specials, greeting cards, and bad sermons. He inspires people to believe in themselves, and he lifts us up so we can walk on mountains. And there is Guru Jesus, a wise, inspirational teacher who believes in you and who helps you find your center. Church, we need to be aware of teaching that, and belief that misrepresents Scripture. There is no other Jesus than the biblical Jesus. Amen. So after confounding the teachers of the law by revealing to them what scriptures really say, that the Messiah is both David's son and David's Lord, Jesus is now going to turn the heat up a little bit more on these leaders. And as he does, we're going to see in his words a second warning, a second warning of hypocrisy. Beware of teaching that misrepresents scripture. And the second one is beware of living that magnifies self. Beware of living that magnifies Self. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. Starting in verse 38. And in his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Now it's clear by Jesus' choice of words here that he, he despised, he despised the way the self-righteous religious leaders showed off. So he warns the people to beware of them. And he rapidly fires off the six things the scribes did that make them so hypocritical. All right, first they flaunt their status. They love to go for strolls in the public places, wearing their long, white linen robes that were reserved only for the religious elite. It's like if I had a collar and I wore that around everywhere. It'd be weird. 
They flaunt their status. They demand respect. The very reason they're strutting their stuff in the marketplace to begin with is that so people will notice them and greet them and stroke their egos. See, you have to realize the people were taught that when you see a scribe, you stop whatever it is that you're in the middle of and you greet that scribe. And you greet that scribe with their high titles of respect because they like their titles. They love their titles. In fact, after tonight, you all have to call me reverend. (laughs) Just kidding. Actually, I hate that title. That's a title I hate. It means to be revered. The only one to be revered is God. Amen. They flaunt their status. They demand respect. They crave recognition. Another thing they did. See, when they're in the synagogue, they love claiming the most important visible seats in the house, the chief seats. Now, these were the seats that that faced the congregation, so everybody could see them. It's like if I was up here preaching, y'all were down there, and Brian comes over, sits here the whole sermon. He wants to be seen. He wants to make sure everybody knows that he's valuable. That's what the scribes did. That's what they did. They crave recognition. They pursue honor. That's another thing they did. Whenever they attended a banquet or a feast, the very best seats were always reserved for them. They were always first in line. They always had the first place. They loved being welcomed as guests of honors because the most honored guests were given the best seats and they were given the best food. Another thing they were guilty of is exploiting the vulnerable. Jesus says here, they devour widows' houses. See, the scribes would use their their legal position to manage the wills and, and some of the other legal business of the widows. But they would cheat the widows by skimming too much out of their estates. They had quite an operation going on here. See, the scribes weren't paid, so, so they, relied, they, they had to kind of raise their own support. So basically what they would do is they would see how many widows and uh, other people that they could, they could oppress, that they could con. They abused their power. They abused their positions of authority to exploit the vulnerable, the very ones they were called to care for. And then the sixth thing is that they exhibit false piety. See, they'd stand up. They'd pray these really long, impressive prayers meant to draw attention. But it was all phony. It was all a show. See, their public prayers were eloquent, but their private prayer closets remained vacant. These scribes did not have hearts that were right with God. They used their positions of authority to feed their selfish ambition. So Jesus assures them, and he assures everyone listening that they will be held accountable. They will be judged. He says they will receive the greater condemnation. As spiritual leaders, they will be held highly accountable to God, and their actions and motives will all be seen by God. God sees everything. Nothing is hidden from him. We can fool each other, but we can't fool him. And they're going to be judged more severely because of the trust that's been extended to them from God and others. And that's true for anybody who's a leader in church. If you're teaching kids or if you're preaching a sermon, that's a position that God has entrusted you with. He's expecting you to do it faithfully with the right motive. Not for your own personal gain, but for the glory of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus detests spiritual hypocrisy. We need to use discernment and wisdom in placing ourselves under the teaching and spiritual influence of others. Don't look to pastors or theologians or authors as replacements for Jesus. There is no replacement for Jesus. One writer put it this way. He said, something in our fallen human nature wants a flesh and blood leader other than our flesh and blood savior to exalt. Our celebrity-obsessed culture plays right into this. Many of us want our spiritual leaders to be celebrities, men and women of acclaim and accomplishment, who tell us what to do so that we don't have to think for ourselves, and who give us hope that we can somehow brush the success, the emotional health, the achievement, and the fame that they've conjured. So please exercise wisdom when it comes to listening to Christian podcasts or reading books or listening to sermons. Be especially wary of sitting under the teaching of those who covet the spotlight. 
Be wary of sitting under the teaching of those who, who revel in being honored, those who exploit their reputation for their own advantage and for the, to the disadvantage of others. And not only do we need to be careful about who we follow and learn from, the other side here is that we all, to need, we all need to make sure that our lives are not magnifying ourselves. See, this world is preoccupied with self. My happiness, my rights, my freedoms, my choices, my successes, my, 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 my. I mean, think about those things that may describe guilty. It was, they were, everything was, was about them. It was not about anybody else. It certainly wasn't about God. Don't we have some of those same temptations? The, the scribes flaunted their appearance. They flaunted their status. Well, doesn't the world tell, tell us the same thing? If you have it, flaunt it. If you look good, if you sound good, if you drive a nice car, if you live in a nice house, flaunt it. Show it off. The scribes also craved recognition. That's nothing new. We face the same temptations of wanting to be seen, of wanting to be heard, of wanting to be noticed. Only we have so many more avenues available to us than the scribes had for themselves. See, we have things like Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, let's see, TikTok, I don't even know all the other ones, Snapchat, you can keep going and going. But whenever my life calls attention to me, Whenever my life calls attention to myself, whenever my life calls attention to I, something is wrong. Whenever my motivation for doing something or saying something comes from me wanting to make myself look better or sound better, I failed. So in a world that lusts for popularity, be humble. In a society obsessed with self-preservation, focus on Jesus and focus on others. Beware of living that magnifies self. And then as we come to the last episode in today's passage, we see our third warning. And our third warning is this. Beware of giving that misunderstands sacrifice. Beware of giving that misunderstands sacrifice. Verse 41. And he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. Okay, so Jesus makes his way to the temple treasury. Now, this is uh, another part inside the temple. And um, in the courtyard where the temple treasury is, it's known as the court of women. Uh, around this courtyard, there are these 13 um, big trumpets. And, and they call them trumpets because they were shaped like trumpets. These trumpets were the, the offering boxes. So they were called trumpets because they were metal. And they, they, they were uh, wide on the top. They were narrow on the bottom. So as people would come and donate their, their offerings, give their offerings to, to God uh, through the temple, they would put them in those trumpets. Well, they didn't have checkbooks, they didn't have cash, they had coins. So it made lots of noise going into the offering box. So Jesus finds a seat across from the offering boxes, and he starts people watching. He sees many rich people. He sees that they're donating large sums of money. And you can visualize kind of the, the, the crowds falling silent as, as a wealthy person approached. Maybe even with other people, because maybe his offering was so big, he couldn't carry it himself. And then they unload all those coins and they go crashing into the offering box. Now, Jesus had just pronounced judgment on the religious leaders for their corruption and their hypocrisy. So I imagine that Jesus does feel grieved as he watches all of this money pour into the temple, knowing it's going to be used to further fund uh, their broken system of religion. But then Jesus suddenly observes something, something different, something unexpected. Verse 42, And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Now these two copper coins, these were called alepta, uh, lepta for two, lepton for one. I just learned that this week. I'm not smart. A lepton was the smallest, uh, most insignificant uh, currency uh, around at that time. In fact, they would actually make them in like, kind of like a strip, and they would just bang them all off. They would kind of all cr crack and be broken, so it would be possible. Like, imagine like if you had like, like a tenth of a penny in your pocket, and you tried paying with that. Like a, a penny broken to ten pieces. Like that's what like this was. Like it was kind of nothing. So, so two lepta represent um, one sixty-fourth of a denarius. There's going to be a test. Um, two lepta equal one sixty-fourth of a denarius. OK? 
okay? A denarius is a day's wage. So this lady puts in two, two lepta, one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. Okay, so using today's figures, that means um, this lady put in about a buck fifty. A buck fifty, that's about one sixty-fourth of a day's wage today. So she quietly approaches the boxes, hoping she doesn't draw attention. She slips the two coins in. And unlike the extravagant offerings of the rich people, her offering doesn't make all the sounds and attract all the attention that theirs did. Now, I find it interesting that it's a poor widow who Jesus points out here. Remember, in the episode right before this, Jesus condemned the scribes. Why? Because they were scamming widows. They were taking advantage of widows. Well, now, here, we have a widow who's giving money to support the very religion whose leaders were taking advantage of her. See, I think one of the things Mark wants us to see here is that this woman is a victim of oppression and injustice. The leaders of Israel have moved so far from the heart of God. You have to understand, when God established the nation of Israel, he charged the leaders of Israel to care for the oppressed. In Deuteronomy 26, it says that every third year, the tithes would go to the Levites, the orphans, the widows, and the foreigners. So the Levites were like the, the priests. So that every three years, the money would go to the Levites, orphans, widows, and the foreigners, the oppressed. And throw the pastors in there with the oppressed. <laughs> but instead of distributing the temple collection like they were supposed to, the leaders line their own pockets with the funds. See, the, the, the thing that you kind of don't hear when you hear the story of the widow's might is, I really believe that the widow should not have even had to put in that offering. She did, and, I, and the Lord honored it for thousands of years. We're still talking about her to this day. Um, but had the leaders actually been leading like they were supposed to, she would have never been there. But not wanting to miss a teaching opportunity, Jesus calls over the disciples. Verse 43. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Now how could Jesus say that she put in more than everybody else? Well, he explains. Verse 44. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. Everything she had. All she had to live on. That was her life savings, a buck fifty. She put it in. She didn't even keep 75 cents for herself. Here is a woman in deep poverty whose life savings amounted to a dollar fifty. These two coins were all she had, but she gave them despite her own need. She gave proportionately so much more than anyone else did, and she understood sacrifice. That's why Jesus said she gave more than the others. See, he was measuring not what they give, but what they kept. The rich people, after giving their offering, still had all their riches. The widow gave it all. She had nothing left. She kept nothing. I love what Donald Barnhouse said. He said, God is more pleased with a small pitcher of water that's overflowing than he is with a large pitcher that's half full. See, unlike the grandstanding religious leaders and rich donors who made a spectacle of their deeds, the widow demonstrates selfless humility. Had Jesus not pointed out this precious woman for the disciples to see, she probably would have been overlooked by everyone else. But Jesus sees what man overlooks. As the disciples and the others were focusing on, on the big gifts being given, Jesus sees the humble sacrifice of this poor widow. Though the other gifts in the offering that day made a lot of noise for all to hear, the widow's coins were heard in heaven. Jesus delighted in her selfless humility, and that stood in stark contrast to the spiritual hypocrisy of the others. So may this serve as a warning to us to beware of giving that misunderstands sacrifice. Like so many others in the temple that day, oftentimes our giving isn't sacrificial. It's comfortable. We tend to give out of our own margin, enough to, to throw something in the plate. 
or to, to, to donate something online, but not so much where it actually cuts into our lives. But, but the widow's sacrifice was so great that when she gave, she wasn't just giving money, she was giving her life. The widow is living out the command to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. See, God's not interested in your money. He wants your heart. He wants you. Jesus detests spiritual hypocrisy. It has no place in our lives. It has no place in our churches. It's only going to hurt our witness in the world. Listen to what John Stott said about this. He said, hypocrisy is hideous. What cancer is to the body, hypocrisy is to the church. It's a killing agent. Unfortunately, hypocrisy is also addictive. And even though Jesus reserved his most severe words of condemnation for the hypocrite, we still seem to prefer that lifestyle to truth and authenticity. And Jesus detests spiritual hypocrisy. So we need to be aware of teaching that misrepresents Scripture. We need to be aware of living that magnifies self, and we need to be aware of giving that misunderstands sacrifice. See, but then if there's anything the widow teaches us, it's that, yes, Jesus does detest spiritual hypocrisy, but he delights in spiritual humility. He delights in selfless humility. I read a story about a pastor of a small rural church in Scotland. And he struggled in his ministry when he wasn't seeing a whole lot of fruit. And one, off, one morning when the offering plate was passed during a service, a young boy stood up, put the offering plate on the ground, and then stepped into it and stood in the offering plate. When asked to explain, the boy replied that he had been deeply touched, and while he had no money to give, what he wanted to give was himself wholly to God. See, the boy who stepped into the plate was a man who became Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat would later be used by God to become a missionary to South Africa to lead so many to the Lord. Jesus detests spiritual hypocrisy, but he delights in selfless humility. Let's resolve to not be hypocrites, but to serve others, to serve Jesus to think of others more and Jesus more than we think of ourselves. To not be afraid to let people see the real us, the authentic us, the Jesus in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that right now, Lord, we would give you freedom to search our hearts, to search our minds. As the psalmist says, search me, God, and know me. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. Lord, and lead me in the way everlasting. God, I pray that you would reveal to us right now those things that we're keeping before you those things in ourselves that we might use to draw attention to ourselves, to call attention to our achievements, our educations, our jobs, our families, our houses, our cars, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that we would be done with all of that, that we would really learn what it means to live to please you and not to impress others. God, I pray that we would go this week serving you, serving others, loving you, loving others in selfless humility. Lord Jesus, thank you for being fully God and fully man. Thank you that your infinite sacrifice was sufficient to cover in an infinite amount of sins. But Lord, in your humanity, Jesus, you also are able to empathize with all of our sufferings, everything we go through. God, for anybody here who has not yet made that decision to trust you, to see Jesus for who he is, the son of David, the Lord of David, promised long ago, 
to come and take away the sins of the world. God, I pray that right now, even in the stillness of these moments, for anybody who has yet to begin following you, that they would do that right now, that they would do that in this next song, Lord, that they would cry out, Lord Jesus, I can't save myself. You can forgive me. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Give me new life. We love you, Jesus. All God's people said.